You've been lost the guy back there. You see, yeah, I thought he was going to come the whole time. People come in, usually. All right, welcome to CS 4510. Uh, the topic, this is 17A, L17A. The topic of today is called Savage's Theorem. In more general, we're going to be doing space complexity today. Space complexity is fascinating in the sense that it is incredibly interesting because it is also incredibly uninteresting. Space complexity classes are those which study a uh, machine with a certain space bound. So we may say space of f of n is the class of languages decided by machines, deterministic Turing machines, which use no more than f of n space. So first off, how do we measure space? Because you can have, for example, a Turing machine that gets stuck in an infinite loop but uses only apparently constant space. What we do is we formalize the space model slightly different than the one tape Turing machine. We have the machine. It has access to a read-only input like a DFA does. And it can only move right on that input. And it can only read the input, right? It's a read-only write-move input. And then it has what's called a work tape. The work tape looks like this. Here's our machine M. And the machine has access to read and write to the, with the work tape. It's a separate tape. So configure, defining configurations of the machine is slightly uh, different. But um, you have to encode not just you know, Q0, W1, WN, but the position on here, and also the symbol being read, the whole tape contents, and also the location here. Right? So, the problem with space complexity, one of the reasons it's like fascinating and also unfascinating, is the fact that when you, uh, it's not a class that measures simultaneously the space and time complexity. Space complexity is uninteresting in the sense that once you finish your computation, you return a single bit as an answer, accept or reject, and you get the space back. The space is freed up from you. But you never get the time back. So what this means is if you're trying to optimize space, Space, a lot of times it comes in the form of a time-space trade-off. But people are usually trying to use more space to speed up time. People are not usually trying to reduce space in order to speed up time, in, in order to increase time, you know? There are some tr things that you can do in space complexity theorems, which are like use super exponential time to save one bit or something like this. Because you don't care about time, you can prove certain things uh, to work certain ways. Um, I'm going to prove to you the, uh, a chain of, uh, of space, uh, uh, time bounds and space bounds. We know that time f of n is a subset of, no, I'll, I'll even write it here. We know that t every language that is decidable in space f of n, excuse me, everything that is decidable in time of f of n is decidable in space of f of n, right? Any machine that uses f of n time can use no more than f of n new cells of the tape. So we know that time of f of n is a subset of space of f of n. We also know that space of f of n is a subset of n space f of n, where n space is a, the space a non-deterministic Turing machine uses on, you know, it has these non-deterministic branches. You measure the amount of extra work tape used on the longest branch. Let's say one, one branch uses linear space. Another branch uses quadratic space. The space bound of that machine, we would say, is quadratic. Now, interestingly, is that if you think about a time bound, reasoning about a time bound is actually very different than reasoning about a space bound. Uh, now, every time bound, every space bound, we, we know that if, if a machine has a time bound, it also has a space bound. But if you have a space bound, you also have a dual time bound. We can simulate n space deterministically in what do we think the time should be. There's going to be an exponential blow up here. It's going to be 2 to the O of f of n. Now what that O is depends upon specific things like the alphabet and whatever, right? Constant stuff. But every non-deterministic space Turing machine, which uses f of n space, means that uh, it has a time bound. The way you should think about this, you should think about a machine having a space bound as if part of its tape has been allocated off. It's that thing has a quadratic space bound. Someone is going to go to the tape and mark off a cell, 
and says, don't, and says, don't use any more than that amount of cells. That's your space bound. The machine is then confined to use whatever it does in here. You know? Meanwhile, like a time bound machine just kind of like, it doesn't know how much time it has left. It just does its computation and, it, and then it sort of is, does, did it within the time frame. The space way, it's good to think of it that way. Let me give you two proofs of uh, this. Consider uh, some uh, non-deterministic Turing machine n on uh, w, right? Well, actually, let me give you the deterministic way first. Let's prove space f of n is a subset of time of f of n, OK? Consider a deterministic Turing machine on uh, w, right? It follows a sequence of configurations. It's going to go c0 to, uh, and then eventually it's going to reach some accepting configuration, right? But what is, as a string description, the size of a configuration of a deterministic Turing machine uh, which has a space bound f of n? What is a configuration of a Turing machine again? It is a string which contains the position of the tape head, it contains the contents of the tape, contains all these things, right? So the space bound is going to be, the, excuse me, the, the machine having a space bound at f of n means the configuration is going to be approximately size f of n, right? O of f of n. Why? Recall the configuration is like q0, w1, wn, right? It's going to be approximately the space used, whatever. It's going to be the entire contents of the tape, which must be less than or equal to the space bound, plus some constant symbol for this one, plus the something here, right? So we, we can say how many configure, possible configurations are there? It's like how many binary strings of length n are there? There's two to the n of them. If there's like three possible symbols for each one up to the space bound, then there are two to the O of f of n uh, possible configurations of a space bounded machine. And this machine has the space bound of f of n. If there are, uh, if the configurations have size O of f of n, then the, uh, there are two to the O of f of n possible configurations, right? Assume to the contrary d takes more than 2 to the o of f of n steps. What must occur? If d takes more than 2 to the O of f of n steps, whatever that is, in terms of its space bound, then we know that there's some configurations i such that there's a configuration ci that appears twice in this computation. Right? As you go from co to c, whatever the accept state is, if this sequence takes more than 2 to the O of f of n steps, there are only 2 to the f of n possible configurations. So if this machine takes more than that number of steps, some configuration appears twice. And because the machine is deterministic, if the configuration appears twice, the machine is actually did not reach that state and go it. This machine is actually stuck in an infinite loop, contradicting the fact that we, this machine, to have a defined space bound, halts at all inputs. Right? We don't consider a machine that gets stuck in an infinite loop to have a space bound. So here we've proven that space, if a machine has a space bound, a deterministic machine has a space bound of n, and it also happens to have this time bound of 2 to the O of f of n. Questions on that? In general, when we write like time and space with a function like in the parentheses, like the parameter we mean like time O of f of n, just like in general. So I am bad with notation, and I'm like doing something illegal here. When you write space of f of n, this really means space of O of f of n. But sometimes I like to throw a little o in there. Yeah. And then I can't do little big O of little o. That's illegal. So I like to put ignore that and just sort of vibe it out, right? That's 2 to the O of n. You know what I'm saying, right? Sure. Yeah, OK. You know what I mean. Yeah. It takes that time. OK. Um, right. So deterministic Turing machine has a space bound. If it has a space bound, it has a time down. It has a time bound. Um, actually, a non-deterministic Turing machine also has a space bound. Excuse me. If a non-deterministic Turing machine has a space bound of f of n, 
then I claim it also has a time bound of of f of n. How are we going to prove this? So again, if we arrange, uh, how did we simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine on a deterministic one? Does anyone remember the strategy taken? You like BFS basically through all possible computation paths. Yeah. We were able to build a recognizer for that. Now if this machine, uh, these are machines that only halt on all inputs. So instead of thinking about an infinite graph maybe getting stuck in a loop, we can just uh, BFS again, but this time on a finite graph. We would build the configuration graph. of n on w. It's going to look like this. The start configuration is going to be q0, w1, wn. And then we look at the transition function of um, the machine, and we write out the next conf possible configurations, whatever those may be. And we see that we get a rooted tree as our, um, uh, as our uh, configuration graph of n, uh, m on w. Um, this, is, this, this is because n does not get stuck in a loop. This tree has no cycle. Uh, it's a rooted tree. The start node is the initial configuration. So deterministically, deterministically build this graph, then BFS on it. Except if you find, like, the, the deterministic simulator will accept if it finds a accepting configuration in this graph. Right? How long does it take to build the graph? Let's upper bound both the time it takes to build this graph and the time it takes to BFS on this graph. How many possible nodes are there? Each node is represented by a configuration, so we may upper bound the number of nodes in a graph like this by the number of possible configurations. If the machine is guaranteed to have a space bound of, f of O of f of n, then we know that it takes, there's only 2 to the O of f of n possible nodes. So to build this graph takes 2 to the O of f of n time. Then to BFS on this graph takes 2 to the O of f of n, if the graph is of size f of n, o of f, 2 to the O of f of n, right? BFS takes linear time in the size of the graph. In fact, you could BFS while you build the graph. You don't have to do those necessarily disjointly. Just BFS while you do it, right? You will halt in no more than 2 to the O of f of n steps. And in fact, you can keep yourself a little counter to make sure you halt in, in less than 2 to the O of f of n steps. Because after you've done that, you've seen all possible configurations of the machine. If none of them are accepting, then the machine does not accept. Great fact about the fact that it has a space bound implies it has a time bound, QED. Right. Questions on this one? It's kind of an interesting application of a graph algorithm here. We can, computation is, you know, this thing we do with algorithms, but it's also the way you can traverse a graph. Uh, kind of interesting we can, how we can apply that there, right? Questions on that? We also, like, when you were saying earlier that you should think of space as, like, drawing a line, we're also not, it's not just that we can not write to the space, but we cannot even like be on the space at all. Can't read or write to it. Traverse a bunch of blanks and then go back. That's not allowed either, even if I don't modify them at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in practice, you could imagine you may not need to. If you wanted to, for example, in, like in a practical pseudocode convert to a Turing machine, you want to store a variable. You don't need to store it 10 blanks away. Just store it like one delimited blank away. Okay, I'll give you one more uh, trivial space complexity theorem, and then we'll get on to Savage's theorem. And part of the motivating reason we use big O is that there's too many machine-dependent <coughs> things in the theory of algorithms that we kind of want to abstract away from and not care about. I can prove to you that space of f of n, you can reduce any constant space algorithm to a no-space algorithm. Space of f of n, a machine with a space of f of n bound can be simulated in space max of 1 and uh, space of n, s of n minus c for any constant c. This is part of the reason we use big O of things, right? Like, what is big O of n squared minus c? That's just big O of n squared, right? 
The motivating reason we use big O for all these things is that up to constant factors, you can speed up anything. This is called a, spe this is called a speed up theorem. You know, if you have an algorithm that uses 25 units of space exactly on all inputs, you have an algorithm that runs in constant time. Right? In fact, this also proves something else. Uh, what does this tell you about constant space algorithms? What is the class of languages decidable in constant space? No, because the space bound means it, it's allowed to use more space on longer inputs. Like a quadratic space bound, maybe if it's sorting an array of n elements, it can use n squared space. Uh, sort of sorting is a bad example, but you know what I mean? Given a longer input, it's allowed to use more space. It, a constant space algorithm is one that uses a fixed amount of space, say five cells of the tape, on all inputs of any length. The set of languages decidable by something that uses exactly one bit of space. What is that? With something we've seen before. Things that can be run on like DFA? Yeah, these are regular languages. Constant space algorithm is going to be done on a DFA. And that's sort of the motivating proof here. Proof, suppose we have an algorithm that uses s of n space. I give you an algorithm that uses s of n minus 1 space. And then perhaps you could apply this, const this construction recursively. Let's say we have a Turing machine that looks like this. And it's like using this kth cell of the tape. Um, it's just reading and writing to these k cells. It has s of n, uh, s of n uh, tape cells at its disposal. What we're going to do is allow it to forget to use one cell of the tape by storing that as a register. Right? What we're going to do instead is, let's say this is the kth cell. We're just going to go pop. It's gone. We're not going to use it now. But how are we going to simulate this access to the cell? We're going to double each possible state. And any time read or write access occurs to that, we're going to uh, simulate that within our states. If we were to read or write to this, this last cell, instead of transitioning reading, writing, and moving, we're going to simulate that read, write, and move on the states itself. By doubling the size of the program, we don't have to store a variable, a single bit. You can th think this actually works in pseudocode, actually. If you just double the length of your uh, code, you don't actually have to um, store an, a single number. Right? Now, is that a, an efficient algorithm? No. But does it work? Yeah. So you can, Now, imagine you were to. Uh, reduce the space by c, a constant, you would have exponential blow up in the number of states. But that's okay. We don't really care about the size of a program um, with respect to space complexity. We're cared about the tape used. So great job. We reduced the space by a constant amount, QED. Questions on that one? Kind of a very high level proof. I'll leave it to you to figure out how to, how to simulate a constant space machine on a uh, DFA. Actually, we could do it real quick. If there's a constant space machine, how many configurations are there? Size of the number of states. How many is that? If you have a constant space machine, how many configurations are there? Yeah, there's a constant amount. So what you do is you just put each configuration in a DFA. And that's a DFA, right? Each configuration is a state of the DFA. You have a really big DFA. It's a big constant, but you have constantly many things. So anything that can be done in constant space can be simply done by a DFA. Now, there are some people who object to this. And no, they take this too far. They're extremists. They say, well, because every computation has a space bound, it looks constant to me. It only used 10 cells of the tape. 
it used 10, 10 kilobytes of RAM. Every language is regular. That's not true. That's not how we measure things. Those people are, don't listen to them. Um, they're all over the internet, and they use this kind of argument to say, well, you know, every language is regular. Okay, turn completeness isn't real, but they're not, they're not sane. Anyway, let's get on to Savage's theorem, the point of today. Savage's theorem is like, it's really elegant. It's a fascinating theorem, uh, both in its corollary, but also in the sense that its proof technique is really elegant. If you talk to old people, old people love Savage's theorem. If you took a poll of like old complexity theorists, what their favorite theorem might be, I would put betting odds as a function of their age that it's Savage's theorem. Savage's theorem um, is discovered in, Savage, by the way, was a PhD student under Steve Cook. He discovered Savage's theorem, and then the rest is history. It's, it's his theorem. What he says, basically, is that uh, the non-deterministic space of f of n is a subset of space uh, f squared of n. So two things. Actually, there was a guy, you know, Juris Hartmanis, founder of complexity theory. He proved a theorem about context-free languages. It was kind of ridiculously complicated. Savage was the one who saw actually this, this can apply to space complexity. And he proved probably the most important theorem in space complexity, the one that we care about, is Savage's theorem. Immediately, you should have red flag whistles going off in your head when you see the statement that I've written on the board. And I'll mention also there's with some restrictions on f. We'll talk about what those restrictions are anyway. They're not too important. But know that they must exist. Um, this is a, a, this is a non-deterministic space class. This is a deterministic space class. So we were able, somehow, just look at the theorem before we get to the proof. We, we, we took a non-deterministic space class, and we were able to, quote unquote, de non determinify it. That's a real word. De non determinify the non-deterministic space class, OK? Yet, we were able to incur only a polynomial cost to the resource being measured, space, OK? The first thought you should have is, that's only a polynomial cost. So actually, what this does prove immediately is if you let uh, define p space to be the class of languages de decidable in polynomial space, huge class, and let n space, np space, equal uh, non-deterministic space classes decidable in polynomial space. Savage's theorem immediately implies uh, that uh, p space is equal to np space, right? We're talking about the corollaries of the theorem before we talk about the, the proof of the theorem itself, but it's fine. p space equals np space. That is different than what we think the relationship non-determinism has for time. We not only, so two things. First off, we can prove p space equals np space. That's the first difference than p equals np, because we don't know how to prove p equals np. This is a hard problem. This was an easy problem. Somebody did this in 1971. Okay? This theorem is now 53 years old, right? Not too hard. Uh, p does an np, p not equal np is still open problem, still unsatisfied. First difference. Second difference is it's the opposite of what we think it should be. We think that these are unequal, yet we are able to prove that these are equal. So it's also basically saying, Non-determinism doesn't really do anything to space complexity classes, up to a polynomial cost. It doesn't help too much, right? P space being equal to NP space is, you know, the great corollary of Savage's theorem. You should look at this theorem, just the result, and try to imagine what the proof might look like. We're going to take a non-deterministic machine with a space bound, simulate it deterministically, and only incur a polynomial cost into the space bound. So somehow we have some sort of simulation technique, which is exotic here, which is going to incur only a polynomial cost to the space. Does that imply anything about it incurring a polynomial cost to the time? It probably doesn't. So we're going to have a deterministic simulator. If you had to conjecture the cost that, that the machine that that time would take, what would you say it is? Yeah. 
Yeah. Essentially, if such a technique that we're, we'll demonstrate to prove this, if such a technique that was able to speed up, not speed up, but with only a, apply a quadratic cost to the space to denondeterminisify it, if such a technique could work for time, someone probably would have figured it out by now. But because we don't, because you know p versus np is still an open question, that means this specific technique probably doesn't keep the space, excuse me, does not translate the time complexity at all. In fact, what we'll do is we'll have an exponential blow up in the time. Whatever time this runs in, this runs in something worse. But that's okay, because it's going to use only a little bit of space. One of the reasons um, people love this theorem is just it's so, it's really elegant. It's just an algorithm. And it's also, to, even to this day, an open question if you can do better than this square. People don't know. I don't think people have been working on that or trying because it's just too, it's just too nice. But everyone is kind of aware that it is an open problem, but no one cares enough to try. At least last time I checked. Big disclaimer on that. So we want to have a non-deterministic machine. I'm erasing it now. And have it be dissimulated deterministically, right? One of the problems is that um, how, does it, how do you do simulation in general? Like in a time complexity scenario, you simulate a machine by it taking one step, and then it takes another step, and then you simulate that one step. You simulate the transition function by letting it take one step, and then it takes another step, right? If the, v, if the VM takes a step, VMware is going to simulate that one step, right? All simulation ever done has been done in this linear fashion, right? When we simulated uh, a Turing machine on an unrestricted grammar, each step of the Turing machine was simulated by a, a steps of the grammar and so on, right? But Savage's theorem uses a very unique um, simulation trick, which is the whole point of it, is it does simulation in an exponential blow up version of divide and conquer, right? You may be aware of divide and conquer techniques, right? Merge sort is a divide and conquer algorithm. What are some other divide and conquer algorithms? Yes. FFT is a divide and conquer algorithm. You basically are going to compute some recurrence, have some base cases, and that's your answer. Here's the, here's the, here's the sort of trick. If, if a machine, if there's a sequence of configurations that CO can reach CA in T steps, that <coughs> is true if and only if there exists some C such that, I'll say it this way, C0 can reach T, reach C in T over two steps, and C can reach CA in T over two steps. Okay? So what, instead, of, instead of simulating the machine C0, C1, C2, C3, C4 as a sequence of configurations from start to end, what are you going to do is fix the start and accept configuration and then brute force search for a configuration in the middle using exponential time. And then you're going to divide and conquer. Just check, OK, can C0 yield CA? Recursively call if there exists a C, such that C0 can reach C and C can reach CA. Now, that is ridiculous. And it's one of those things like this is technically an algorithm that has no application to the real world. You could never write this code and expect it to be feasible to run. Yet it is sufficient for us to show a deterministic simulation of NP space of n space on a quadratic blow up machine. Okay. We're going to create a divide and conquer algorithm, and then we're not going to measure the time complexity of it using like the master theorem or anything. We're going to use, we're going to measure the space complexity of the algorithm. Any questions before we jump into the meat on that one? So then from there, the algorithm is, is I mean, we basically said it. The reason we're doing a divide and conquer algorithm is that space, again, like when you run a computation, you never get the time back. But you can always get the space back. So if you have an, a recursive algorithm, you can re perform the recursive calls sequentially instead of th with threads or something. And that allows them to reuse space. Once a recursive call returns, the space remaining it's used is just a bit. So the second recursive call can just use the same space. So you don't increase the space here. Right? What we're going to define 
is this yields function yields, we'll say def uh, yields, and it'll take on input a configuration, two configurations, and a time bound t. And it's supposed to uh, return true if ci can yield cj in t steps, right? Exactly t. Exactly t. Uh, those little edge cases will work out when we do the proof. We'll end up overestimating the time bound, right? Because if a machine, let's say it takes a literal n squared minus n steps, and we say it takes big O of n squared, it won't be exactly t, but that's fine. Um, it's the same thing when you merge sort on an array that's not exactly a power of 2. You just, oh, now you have the 3. You have to just sort of like do the powers of 2 back up. It's, it's a little edge case. Um, so first off, every recursive algorithm needs a base case. Our base cases are if t equals 0 or t equals 1. So if ci is equal to cj, uh, return true. OK, ci does yield cj in t steps, whatever t is, right? Uh, if uh, t is greater than, excuse me, t is equal to 1 and ci yields cj in uh, one step of delta of n, return true. OK. Do we agree that those are our two base cases? If ci is cj or ci is yielded in one step of the configuration, it yields cj. Next, if t is greater than 1, we need to brute force search for some c. So I'm going to say uh, for c a configuration of n of size, O of f of n, it has space bound f of n, right? So there are uh, n has configurations of size O of f of n if it has space bound f of n. So there are two to the O of f of n possible configurations. This is the part that makes this not a real algorithm, but it's a hypothetical algorithm. Brute force search for such a configuration C. And then you're going to return yields. C i c t over 2 and yields c c j t over 2. Okay. Then after all that, you still need like a, what happens if none of that happens. So you need a return false here. Okay. This is the recursive algorithm, but we don't have an entry point into it. Before we get into the entry point, let's agree that this works. Do we have any qualms that this works? I mean, it, we'll argue about the efficiency in a second, but first let's agree that, the, that it does correctly simulate the non-deterministic machine. This is a deterministic algorithm, by the way. We we're, are given a non-deterministic Turing machine with space bound f of n. We are simulating the non-deterministic machine deterministically with divide and conquer. Now, is this brute force search really expensive? And will most of these calls return false? But if n accepts such a c exists, you just brute force find it. You can do that in polynomial space. Right? And then you return true when both recursive calls return true. Right? Now we need a way to enter it into the algorithm. Okay? So we'll say. Um, Middle return also. Like that only occurs if. We evaluate to true. Like if both conditions in the yield are true, then we return. True. Yes. Maybe I should have worded that a little better. You don't want to return false for that one. Yes, you would return false. Yeah. You want to return true. The algorithm returns true if all of the base cases return true, right? This is going to make a recursive call, which will make a recursive calls, will make a recursive calls. You'll maybe 10 layers down, you'll find a return false. The whole thing will return false. You only want to return true if both of these calls return true. Yeah. Making sure I didn't have a typo or something. OK, we need an entry point in this algorithm. So we'll say uh, d is our deterministic simulator on input 
uh, w, it's going to have the code of n hard-coded. And then it's going to compute c0 is initial configuration of n on w, which is going to be like q0, w1, wn. Depends on how we measure the space. This is a initial configuration. Again, the configuration, we've done it for the one-tape deterministic Turing machine. It's actually machine dependent. The configuration for this machine, oh, I erased the picture. But the configuration of this machine is a little different because it has an input tape that's finite and uh, move write only, read only. And it has this extra work tape, right? So the configuration would be done a little differently. We'll talk about what that configuration will look like in a second. Um, and let's see A be um, some unique accepting configuration. Maybe it's just the string QA. Now you can make, now a in general, by the way, this is very important. Turing machines do not have unique accepting configurations. But that's OK. You can assume without loss of generality that they do. First, you modify n. You modify the transition function of n such that when it actually was supposed to accept, instead it's going to erase all its tape and then halt. Right? When a machine halts, it just leaves the tape. You know, it doesn't have to free the tape. Like malloc and free, it doesn't have to free it before it accepts. It just can just throw its, its, its tape head on wherever it's supposed to be. You can modify the ter transition function you believe to accept with a unique configuration, right? Uh, D is equal to be, it's chosen in such a way that uh, n has uh, uh, less than uh, 2 to the d f of n configurations. And then you're going to enter into d with yields c0, ca, 2 to the d f of n. Why do you enter with this time bound 2 to the d f of n? Because you know the machine, if it has an f of n space bound, I erased it again. If it has an f of n space bound, you know we proved that the non-deterministic, uh, we proved that n space f of n is a subset of time uh, 2 to the O of f of n, right? So if a machine has f of n space bound, you know it also has a time bound for some d 2 to the d f of n, right? This is the top level recursion call. This algorithm is going to enter here. This is going to do all the recursion for us, right? Um, how do we know how to choose D here? Uh, what, do, what, are, what are our theories? How would we choose a D to be sufficient? D should be like log alphabet length over 2 plus 1 if you want, so you can absorb all the constants too. I see. We could do a direct calculation, I suppose. Another way we could do is just try d equals 1, d equals 2, d equals 3 until it works. Right? That would work, too. Uh, Since we don't care about time, yeah. Well, we don't care about time. So <laughs> we, don't, we don't care about time. Great. Yeah, let me just brute force search for the, for the time bound on that machine. OK. We have constructed an algorithm here. Would, let's first, before we get to the analysis, any qualms about the correctness of the simulation? Deterministic simulator simulates a non-deterministic machine using a divide and conquer technique. Crazy construction, but that works. Before we get to the measuring the, the time complexity, excuse me, the space complexity, any qualms on that? OK. Let's measure the uh, time complexity. How do you, excuse me, the space complexity. How do you measure the time complexity of a recursive algorithm? Does anyone remember? Master theorem. You basically, because the master theorem, you space, excuse me, time is not reusable. So when you measure the time complexity of a, of a recursive algorithm, a divide and conquer algorithm, you have to use the master theorem. And it basically counts the size of these binary trees or trinary trees as a function of the arity, the size of each input on each level, and so on, right? But importantly, divide and conquer here, those recursive calls can run sequentially. So we don't actually need to measure the width or anything of this binary tree. I claim the space complexity is exactly two things. One, it's the recursion depth. 
multiplied by the stack frame size. If you have like a 2110 level of understanding of that, that sounds right, right? You put the stack frame, you make a recursion call, you look at the next stack frame, you're going to make a recursive call, you're going to put another stack frame, right? You're going to have the, the, the amount of space used is going to be some number of stack frames and then times the size of each stack frame. That's going to be the space bound. Okay. Let's try to estimate each. What is the recursion depth here? So this is almost master's theorem like. How would we count the recursion depth? When do we make a recursive call? When we take a, what do we do each time is every time we make a recursive call, we divide t by 2. So how many times can we divide t by 2 before we hit a base case? Yes. Log t. The recursion depth is going to be log t. But what is the upper bound on t? The recursion depth is O of f of n. OK. What about the stack frame size? What is encoded on to each um, stack frame? What are the parameters of each, each uh, passed in variables when you make a stack frame call? It's going to be an encoded version of two configurations and t, which t is a counter, right? What is the size of a configuration? So we have O of f of n plus O of f of n. And it's O of f of n in case there's like one symbol for this state or, you know, something like this, all that extra stuff. Um, what's the maximum size of t? What is the maximum value of t? Through the d of f of n. Right. So if you have a number that's less than, if t we know is less than or equal to 2 to the d of f of n, how do you write down a number? d f of n bits. It takes, takes log of t to write down t. So this is also going to be plus log t, because it takes log t bits to write down t. So, but log t we know is also just O of f of n, right? So the stack frame size is just O of f of n. So we have a recursion depth of f of n. We have stack frame size of f of n. So this runs in space O of f squared of n, QED. Question? Oh, never mind. We incurred a quadratic cost here in space, but we don't have to, we don't have non-determinism anymore. Right? If you were to try, I would let, leave it to you as an exercise to try a, a naive denon-determinismifying strategy. Suppose you tried to simulate sequentially. You have to keep a lot of things on the tape if you're doing that with BFS, right? Here, you kind of don't have to. You know, when, you, when, a, recursion, when a recursive call returns, it's going to return one bit up the stack, right? So all this auxiliary information that's needed in the naive way is not needed in Savage's way, right? Are there any questions or, or qualms with this analysis of the uh, thing? Okay. I promised you there were two restrictions on what kind of f we could do. Now, for f is good and nice, this never really matters. But it turns out for small space complexity or time complexity classes, you have to be very careful. Okay? p is a very robust class. But when you're talking about things that are machine dependent, it's actually not robust. So in fact, for example, if I, what is the difference between space uh, log, log, log n and space log log n. So let's say you have an input of size 2 to the 100. Space log log n would be allowed to use 6 bits, 6 cells. If you have an input larger than the universe, you could use 6 cells of the tape in log log n space. Log 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 n space, you can use 1 cell of the tape. Okay. What is the difference between these two complexity classes? In fact, there's so little space here involved, they might be equal, right? Even though the asymptotics are, are the same. If the asymptotics are so small, they're so inconsequential, they might end up being the same. That's what ends up happening, right? There's a famous proof, I won't do it, but you can actually prove time of little o of n log n is regular. Now, that is asymptotically not n log n, but it's like just below n log n. 
Turns out, if you increase the amount of time you have to just below n log n, like n log log n, you can still simulate that on a DFA, it turns out. That's kind of a difficult and combinatorial proof, but weird things happen at the low end, right? We usually care about the big end. We take asymptotics at things. But what happens at the low end? So there's two restrictions on f. One is on the size of f, and one is on um, constructability of f, right? Important here, we passed in f of n. So the machine has to know what f of n is. Right? So the first requirement is what's called space constructability. Space constructability basically means the function can be computed. And to compute f of n takes f of n space. Whatever it takes to compute map the string of all ones, of n ones, to the to f of n takes uh, f of n space. Now, every function you've ever seen that have, you've ever partake, pertained interest into has the space constructability property. You know, how long does it take to write? Basically, the machine has to be able to write down its own counter. Okay, it shouldn't take more time to count itself than the counter allows. All these functions are space constructible. N log n log n log n, right, n squared, and so on. All the nice functions are space constructible. You can come up with some weird ones. For example, like uh, let's say f of n. Let's say f of i is equal to uh, n squared if uh, m i halts on w, and then like 2 to the n if m i loops on w. That's a weird function. What is that? What is that? If 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 you if you give in a machine and it has that as a time bound or a space bound, what does it do? What I mean, I don't know what to do with that, right? It's an uncomputable function. So that's a weird one. That you can't compute at all. So certainly it's not computable in a certain space bound. You can construct all kinds of weird things. Okay, functions are weird. They they can do you know the nth prime number takes a billion bit hours to compute something like this, right? It's all kinds of weird stuff. So space constructability is a bare minimum. The second thing is actually there's a lower bound on f. Um, it turns out that f of n uh, can be reduced to sublinear space through the model of machine that we used, right? There is a lower bound to space complexity here. Savage's theorem does not apply to the world's smallest. If you have a non-deterministic log-log space, might not be able to be efficiently de-non-determinatified, right? But in the end, it doesn't matter because you could brute force search those small classes. The reason for this is we have a lower bound on the size of the configuration of a machine, right? Consider the non-deterministic machine looks like this. It has access to its read-only write-move input tape, and then it also has this work tape, right? So what, what is the information that's contained in a possible uh, configuration of the machine like this? It's not the one-tape Turing machine, right? It has a work tape. It's got... Uh, n positions, this is going to be size f o of f of n, right? But then it's got n positions it could be on the input as well. So it's a pair like this of the read-only right-move input head tape and then the space of, that's used currently on the bottom. So it's going to be this size. I mean, it's going to be, that is going to be a configuration of the machine. It's going to be tupled in that way. And then the... the um, Number of possible configurations, then, is going to be the number of possible encodings of that, which is going to be log of n times the number of possible encodings of this is going to be 2 to the O of f of n, right? So this is going to give us log of n plus f of n, right? So we see that this, the configuration still can't be smaller than log n, at least in this construction. You may be, maybe you can prove a unique kind of Savage's theorem for very small space complexity classes. People are still interested in small space complexity classes, but we know it's at least through log of f of n, log n, and more, which is the ones we care about. Questions on this? Savage's theorem? Uh, awesome. Let's take a little break.